When I first started making movies, I thought that the most important thing was a great script, or a great production value, or a great idea. But after over a decade of struggling to get my films off the ground, I realized I had been missing a critical part of the planning stage. A key that all but determined the success of everything that follows. So in this video, I'm gonna reveal what this missing key is, how any level of filmmaker can explode the success of their films by implementing it, and show you examples of how films have found success once they harnessed its epic power. But first, let me show you what happened when I didn't do this and the change it made when I did. Because this mistake is literally costing indie filmmakers their careers. Just getting the movie done is an accomplishment in itself. And if we're honest, we haven't really given much thought to what we're gonna do with this movie when it's done. And we hope that the conventional wisdom of placing your film in a film festival circuit where it can be seen by a distributor who understands the magic of selling movies can take it off our hands and we can sit back and relax and watch the money roll in. Or maybe you can at least pay back your funders. If your film can't make money or pay back its funders or get people to even watch it, this is why most filmmakers never get to make a second movie. We're forced into a premature retirement. But here's a harsh reality check. Distributors don't need you. You need them. They have all the leverage and they hold all the cards, which means that in the rare instance that your film does get seen by a distributor at a film festival, the deals they offer you are probably gonna be pretty bad. And let's say you do get a decent deal. Distributors don't promote you. That's not what they do. They put you in a catalog so that resellers can access your product at wholesale rates. That's it. And as you can imagine, in most cases that means crickets. Because no one knows about your movie. So no one buys it. Now I'm not saying the distributors are useless. They have the ability to get you in front of Netflix and Amazon and Tubi and on major streaming platforms, for example. But they don't need you either, which means pennies on the dollar or outright rejection. And that is exactly what we did with our first feature films. We needed a way to flip the script, to create demand for our movies so that the streaming services would pay big bucks to have exclusive rights to your film because now simply having your movie on their platform isn't a means of bringing exposure for viewers to find your movie, but your movie actually is bringing subscribers to their platform. Their offers to you are based on the demand for your movie. But most filmmakers don't have any clue about marketing or sales, and that distributors don't market your movie. Most filmmakers don't know how to create demand for their movie. We didn't either, but this is how we did it. And you can too. This is Mayflower 2, our third feature film. A sci-fi adventure film set in a dystopian near future. With a budget of about $30,000, so not very much. In objective terms, you might say we had a pretty weak film. Some would even say unwatchable. And despite knowing the helpful adage that do something over and over and over again and expect different results is insanity, that's exactly what we did. Just like on our first and second film, we finished our third film with no clear idea of how we were going to distribute it. Now you might be thinking, I thought this video was about planning, and yet your movie is done? The takeaway here is that this key is so powerful, it can be implemented even after a film is completed. But it would be exponentially more powerful if you started with it. Because that's all easier said than done, I'm gonna break it down for you right now. Step one of this planning stage is to create an audience avatar. And I don't mean like a surface avatar, and this goes way beyond gender, ethnicity, location, age. You really need to dig deep and find out why is this person going to pay you money to watch your movie instead of some other guy's movie or Hollywood's movie. So in the case of Mayflower 2, which we just happened to launch right in the middle of COVID, our avatar's name was John. John is a Christian dad living in the United States. He's a family man. They attend church on a regular basis. His wife might even homeschool his kids. John and his family speak English, but they also speak Christianese. He's worried about the world that his kids are growing up in. He's concerned about economic instability and social unrest. 
He's worried about the potential for future persecution, fear for their children, fear of pain and trouble. Indoctrination, chaos, corruption are things that keep him up at night. And deep down, he's really frustrated with the interruption of the American dream. Is it really going to be, we're back after these messages, or is it gone forever? And he secretly just wants peace and affluence, to be left alone and live his life without resistance. They just want things to go back to normal to the way they used to be. They're a little bit overwhelmed. As far as other media, they like Christian worldview ministries, and they watch end times movies, and listen to conservative talk radio. In his lifetime, he's seen a lot of change. COVID recently, but recessions, 9-11, riots, and massive changes to the cultural value system. John's life trend has been from perhaps an unrealistic optimism to a subjective pessimism. And if you're saying, I don't know what questions to ask, you know what, I think I'll put some of these questions in the description below so you can check them out. And once we had a really good grasp of John and what made him tick, we moved on to step two, which was to determine Mayflower 2's unique selling position and what its compelling offers were for John and his family. Looking at John's profile, we concluded that his current situation was one of uncertainty and fear and struggling with tension. But he wanted to feel more prepared for what was coming. He wanted to be challenged and encouraged. He wanted to be reaffirmed and to feel like he wasn't alone. He wanted stronger conviction and resolve. He wanted to be braver and more confident, bolder, even courageous. So we wanted to position Mayflower 2 as something that could help him get there. And Mayflower 2's engaging and thought-provoking story with identifiable characters and themes, along with the discussion guide, could help him bridge that gap. Were there other ministries and resources that might help John make that transition? Sure, but Mayflower stood out because it had spaceships. It was fun. It had a significant historical connection in the Mayflower. And the theme of the wimpy Christian martyr was unique and resonated strongly. From there, we began to craft our marketing material. We made sure that our synopsis and description and all of our marketing copy tied in strongly to these strengths. Because John is thinking a lot about persecution and standing strong in the face of trouble, we said things like, be challenged to consider where you stand with God and consider what your response will be in the face of looming persecution. Learn that true courage comes from fearing God, not man. This is a place where a lot of filmmakers go wrong. They assume that their movie is just entertainment. And while some movies might be that, most good stories appeal to something more, to something deeper. And we need to figure out what that is. People spend money because they want a change. And even in the case of entertainment, they're looking to transform their life from a life of boredom to a life of being entertained, at least for a couple hours. And if you can figure out what your story's cause is, you'll have a much easier time attracting your audience. We identified five themes and lessons that would resonate deeply with John and his family. Courage in the face of persecution, political agendas, personal peace and prosperity, religious freedom, and the gospel. All five of these themes are themes that John is deeply wrestling with on a daily basis. And we know this because we understood who John was in step one and identified our movie's strengths and made it uniquely appeal to John in step two. We were able to identify compelling clips to use in our marketing and promotion. And we were able to craft a trailer specifically targeted to John. Once we had our marketing materials planned out, we moved on to step four. A compelling website is good and all, but if nobody knows it's there, nobody's gonna find it. Promoting a movie can be expensive, and I have seen a lot of movies totally blow their budget on promotions that almost guaranteed did absolutely zero. Because the first trick to a successful marketing campaign is making sure you're actually putting your promotion where your avatar, where your potential audience actually hangs out. If your audience is Gen Z, a newspaper ad or a radio ad isn't gonna reach them. It's gonna be a waste of money. And if your audience is middle-aged Christian women, TikTok's probably not gonna do it for you, but Facebook will. The main thing is not to assume that your audience is like you. Just because you read a newspaper doesn't mean they do. And just because you don't use Facebook doesn't mean they don't. The second key to a successful marketing campaign is understanding the difference between an intent-based campaign and a disruptive campaign. Intent-based marketing campaigns 
are ideal for audiences that are looking for something. This is things like plumbers, restaurants, things that people will type into Google because they're looking for an answer or solution. And disruptive marketing campaigns are ideal for audiences that don't know that your movie exists. They don't know to look for it. And so you have to get in front of them and disrupt their usual pattern so that they can learn about your movie. In the case of Mayflower, looking at John and our movie, we understood that nobody was going to be doing any searches for our movie. We needed to get in front of people who had no idea that we existed. And for Mayflower, we knew that Facebook would be a perfect way to get in front of John, especially since Facebook would allow us to play our trailer in our ads. Now here's another bonus tip. Don't make one trailer. We actually ended up making four trailers. Why? Because you wanna run your promotions like a science experiment. You want to structure them in such a way that you get feedback from your audience to determine what is resonating and what's not. So we ended up actually creating four trailers, each targeted to John, but in a different way. So that as we saw feedback of which trailers were getting watched and which trailers were actually getting click-throughs to our website, we could better understand which messages were actually resonating with John the deepest. In addition, we were able to take those resonating movie clips that we had selected earlier and use those for retargeting for people who had seen the trailer but hadn't quite committed to buying yet. In the end, we were able to run Mayflower ads on Facebook for nine months, spending about $2,000 a month and making about $1,000 profit after you take out ad expenses, DVD costs, and shipping. But the ultimate goal of the campaign wasn't actually to make money through DVD sales ourselves. It was to drive up interest. And as long as we were able to run that Facebook campaign, we saw a significant correlation between the campaign and all other revenue sources. Tubi, Amazon, you name it. But we don't just have to imagine how much more powerful this planning stage would have been if we had implemented it at the beginning of our film, right at the scripting phase of Mayflower rather than at the end. Because we can see this in almost any successful film, whether indie or Hollywood. The Irwin brothers at one point said that they won't make a film unless there is a built-in audience. You see that with their films like October Baby, Pro-Lifers, Mom's Night Out. Mother's Day cards sell way better than Father's Day cards for a reason football movies about famous football teams, movies about famous songs. At its core, it's the same process. They are identifying a surefire buyer for their film before they spend a penny making it. And Hollywood does this too. All you have to do is look at the top 10 grossing movies of the year for pretty much any given year. And you'll find that at least seven out of the 10 are derivative works based on existing popular franchises, books, or remakes of successful classic films. And when you identify who your built-in audience is at the beginning, you will maximize your chances of success. Thanks for hanging out with me today. Just a reminder that I have put some of the questions to get you started in the description below, along with some links to tools that we use to build our Mayflower website. So I'll let you guys check that stuff out. Thanks for watching. See you next time.